I'm Jason Wright, and this is the Texas Titans Podcast. Just like the name of the podcast suggests, I will be visiting with Texas Titans of business, academia, sports, or whatever their chosen field, looking for the disciplines and habits that have made these Texans so remarkable. Success leaves clues, and I want to crack the code to these Titans' success and share it with you. Thank you for joining me here on the Texas Titans Podcast. Welcome to the Texas Titans Podcast. My name is Jason Wright, and I am so excited to introduce you to one of my very dear friends and one of the foremost professionals in the area of communications that I have ever met, Mary Spaeth. Mary Spaeth has what can only be described as a storied career. She is truly a Renaissance woman. She is a business leader, a thought leader, and someone who I think you're going to thoroughly enjoy listening to today. So I'm really excited about this podcast. I'm really excited to introduce you guys to Mary. And I'm going to read her professional bio, which just really doesn't do her justice. You're going to find out through the course of the interview uh, that there's so much more to her based on the stories that she tells and just the the amazing life she's led. But here is Mary's professional uh, bio. Mary has a unique background in media, government, politics, business, and entertainment. She is a thought leader in communication theory, a master of executive coaching, and acknowledged as one of the most influential communication counselors in the world. Before founding Spaith in 1987, Mary was a producer for ABC's 2020, a speechwriter for the legendary founder and chairman of CBS, William S. Paley, and was assigned to FBI Director Judge William Webster while serving as a White House fellow. All of this culminated into her roles as Director of Public Affairs for the Federal Trade Commission and ultimately her appointment as Director of Media Relations at the White House in the Reagan administration. Mary is a sought-after public speaker who provides strategic communication, counseling for companies and executives across the globe. She is also a dedicated mother, dog lover, and needlepoint enthusiast. Mary is, in a word, awesome. And I'm so excited that you are here, you are listening, and you are going to get to meet my friend, Mary Spaeth. Enjoy the podcast. Well, welcome to Texas Titans podcast. I'm here with my dear friend, Mary Spaeth. Mary, thank you so much for being here and doing this with me. Oh, what a pleasure. Well, and I want to tell everyone that uh, Mary is overcoming a cold, so I'm, I, I thank you even more for taking the time to be with us. And if you hear some throat clears or whatever, we'll try to edit that as much as possible. But but bear with her. She's doing this. She's a wounded soldier, but she's in anyway. Of course. Well, thank you so much. All right. So Mary Spaeth, president, CEO, and founder of Spaeth Communications. Uh, you are somewhat of a renaissance woman. That's one of the things that I talk about in my intro to the podcast. You've done some really cool and amazing things. So the first thing I would like for our listeners to hear is just kind of where you're from, how you ended up. Uh, you, you did your uh, your education, came from Columbia, then you end up in Hollywood, then you end up in the Reagan administration, and then now here you are, the go-to professional for crisis management in Dallas, Texas, you know, helping folks all over the the nation. So kind of take us through how that trajectory went. Well, listen, first of all, my late father used to say that I turned my resume into a bio to cover up the fact that I could never hold a job for more than a year. I could relate to that. And um, it's one of those things that looks great in hindsight, but actually I just have been alive at a very fortunate time, and I've hopped from one thing to another. And I had the great benefit is that it, it all came together when we moved to Dallas but I want people to know that it was not planned. I mean, I'd like them to think it was very strategic, but actually it was just luck. Right. And the, um, I guess, um, uh, I'm not sure where to start first. Um, the movie, The World of Henry Orient, that Jason's referred to as a Turner Classic movie now, and it's a movie about stars Peter Sellers as a womanizing pianist um, and he's doing just fine in New York City until these two 14-year-olds develop a crush on him and follow him around. And it's viewed as one of the quintessential New York City stories. Great footage of the two of us running around on New York, and I ended up in it. George Roy Hill was the director, the uh, guy who directed The Sting and Butch Cassidy and The Sundance Kid, and he always said that Henry Orient was his favorite movie. And um, 
what happened was that uh, as a publicity stunt, George said, I want two non-professional teenagers. So they went, they sent uh, casting directors all over the country and they got to Germantown Friends where I was in school in Philadelphia. We had just put on Alice in Wonderland and everybody thinks, oh, you must have been Alice. No, I was Tweedledee and the White Knight, a double role. <clears throat> but the, um, the drama teacher didn't want to play favorites, so she sent the whole drama club's contact info. So we all trooped up to read for a casting assistant. And to everybody's shock, the only person they were interested in was me. So we went back and forth and back and forth to New York because it's a, it, I had to match up with whoever was going to be the other girl. And finally, just before we started filming, they found Tippi Walker. And United Artists called our home one night. My dad, it was a very busy doctor, picked up the phone. And this voice said, Dr. Spaeth, this is United Artists. Great news, we're picking up your daughter's option. And my father had no clue what they were talking about, so he hung up. Um, fortunately, they called back. And if anybody gets a chance to see it, The World of Henry Orient is a charming movie. Um, we had our 50th anniversary in, uh, for, for Turner Classic Films, and I got to go out to the West Coast. The lead movie was Oklahoma, which was remastered, but Henry Orient was the second. And I had a wonderful time because it was back on the red carpet. I had handlers again, and you could see people come up to me and say, I have no idea who she is, but she's got handlers, so we probably should get an autograph. But the funny thing, the final piece of this, and as, I, <clears throat> as I walked the red carpet before the screening, the, you know, the uh, uh, Turner Classic Film people said that you've got a bunch of fans who want to talk to you. And so there at the end of the red carpet, there are these bleachers, and there are probably 100 fans. And they all say, hi, Gil. And because my character's name was Marion Gilbert, who went by Gil. So I said, hello. And I, I, I hope this doesn't, I hope this sounds okay. They knew all the dialogue. Wow. So they would say things like, do the cigarette scene. And I'll do the scene where Tippy and I pick up a cigarette butt of uh, Henry Orange that we found, and I unwrap it, and she says, no filter. And then my line is, he's not scared. So they would say it along with me. They'd go, no filter. And before I could say my line, they'd all, they yelled out, he's not scared. <laughs> anyway, I was charmed by it. I thought it was, um, it was very sweet. And it is a delightful movie, well worth anybody's time, particularly if you have young daughters. Well, and I do, and so that it, Rylan, whenever she comes home, we're actually going to watch it together. Abby and I, we usually have movie night every week, and I wanted to watch that in preparation with her for the interview. Obviously, I've done my research, but the girls and I are going to watch it. And I've got to think that going through something like that, it's almost like being in a concert, and whenever you're singing a song and the audience starts singing back to you, it's got to be kind of flattering and overwhelming to go, this many people know this dialogue. That's got to be pretty pretty cool. Well, it was a lot of fun. It creates a real bond. Um, I have another totally unrelated story, though, but on that same line. Lisa, when I was at uh, 2020 at ABC, I was getting a reputation for being a thoughtful producer. And before you say, oh, that's great. No, no. A thoughtful producer is an insult. Oh, really? Okay. No. Too many, you know, I had done a series on gifted children. and No, 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 no. That's, that's not good. So I had to rescue my reputation. And I found myself on an airplane with Liberace's manager, the flamboyant pianist. And so I said, and he, he remembered my movie uh, and, uh, and was a Peter Sellers fan. And I said, you know, why hasn't Liberace ever cooperated with any of the, the news shows? I mean, he'd be, he'd be great. And they said, well, you know, it's, it's the thing. He said, I, and he said, well, you know, he's gay. I said, nobody cares. I said, well, he cares. And back in the 1950s, there was a lot of terrible publicity that almost cost him a career. So I said, well, what if I can work that out so that um, he's asked about it and responds in a way that he's comfortable with? Would he cooperate then? And uh, Seymour Heller was his manager. He says, I think he would. So I go back to 2020, and sure enough, uh, they said, yes, if, as long because you're going to have to mention it. But it, sure, we, everybody's been waiting for Liberace to cooperate. So um, uh, we go out to uh, Las Vegas with a full crew. Okay, This is my redemption from being thoughtful, right? I'm going to show I can do this. And we film four shows. And if anybody's, and we have a link to it on our website if anybody's interested. And in each number, Liberace comes out with a costume that is more and more and more 
flamboyant. And the last costume he comes out with is a black tux. And he comes to the front of the stage and he says, do you like my costume? It's the buttons. He picks up a button, he says, they're real diamonds. And they spell out my name. So he touches the buttons on the front of his coat, L, I, B, E, R. And then he turns around on the two buttons on the back waistcoat, he says, C, E. And then he says, are you looking at the buttons? Well, Liberace's fan base was multi-generational. So there were people at these shows who had seen him you know, as teenagers who were back now as adults with their kids, and they knew all the lines. So he'd go L-I-B-E-R, turn around, but before he could say anything, they'd go, are you looking at the buttons? <clears throat> and I once, and I said to, uh, he went by Lee, I said, Lee, who, he wrote his own material, I said, don't you ever worry about it getting stale? And he said, no, I try that about 10% that's new each year because the audience expects the lines they've been useful, uh, used to. And so I love that, L-I-B-E-R-C-E. Are you looking at the buttons? Wow, uh, that's interesting. All right, well, let's, let's fill in some gaps there. So first of all, did you want to be an actress, or was that kind of like I was in the right place at the right time, and someone saw me and said, hey, kid, you look great in the movies. How did that happen, and then how did the transition go from Hollywood to 2020 kind of into a communications professional? Well, I worked in the summers after Henry Orient. In fact, um, I just got somebody just sent me a copy of one of the TV shows, uh, the nurses that I was on where I died of leukemia. I, I'm now fine. Uh, <clears throat> Wonderful. And um, and I did that. And then I did uh, um, a stage play called The uh, Chalk Garden, which became a movie with Haley Mills. I did that on tour, um, but I had a blind, what I described to my dad as a blinding um, attack of temporary sanity. Um, I went to Smith College, um, worked as um, in between, and I worked as a reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer, where I would still be if they hadn't sold the paper. But then they were casting the Gidget movies, and I got called for that, so I went out and spent a summer in um, Hollywood. And this sounds so pathetic now. There were drugs um, and sex, you know, shocking, isn't it? Shocking. Right, right. I came back and said to my dad, these people are nuts. Um, I mean, they are all truly nuts. But the thing that, first of all, I don't think I really, my only talent was being me. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really, I wasn't good at anything. I was tall in an age when ingenues were short and, um, uh, but the most things, there was no relationship between how hard you worked and any kind of success. It was purely uh, serendipitous. And I've always been over-motivated, um, and I've had a very strong work ethic. So um, I had got into other things. And um, let me just put it, there was no great clamor for Mary Spaeth to come back to Hollywood. But um, over the years, I just did a variety of different things. And um, when I was in New York... Um, freelancing in every place I could that would hire me. Um, I looked at what was happening in, in the mid-1970s. I don't know if any of your listeners were born at that point, but cable was just coming in, and um, the five boroughs had been wired for cable. And so all these apartments, they had this huge number of people who had cable, but no content. And Warner Communications um, was desperately trying to encourage people to produce content. And so um, you could buy television time, wait for it, for $25 a half hour. <clears throat> In the meantime, the New York Times had just started the weekend section. And I thought, well, this obviously means there are a lot of people who are interested in what's going on in the five New York City boroughs on the weekend. So I put together a group of volunteers, there were about 25 of us, and we put on a show called Manhattan Weekend. It aired for 30 minutes Thursday night and 30 minutes Friday night. And we covered all the things that the New York Times didn't cover. So street fairs and new restaurants and all the sort of interesting things, the off, 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 off Broadway plays. And we were the first cable production company to have general advertising dollars. I had a contact, and this is really funny, with Bankers Trust and their ad agency said, don't bother with cable, it's a fad, it's not going anywhere. But their head of marketing said, well, you know, we 
think we should experiment with it. It couldn't be cheaper. And so they advertised a product called the Miss a Month Loan. And you could actually miss a month. I still know all the words to the ad. And I loved it because people actually thought you could miss a month. It actually just gets added on yeah. to the back of your right. loan. Right. But what happened on that is that um, our first quarter, our first 13 weeks, were really wildly successful. And then the studio that we were in, which was, as you can imagine, pretty low budget, had a flood. And we moved to a new studio where our costs doubled and our revenues stayed the same. But we were so committed to this. I mean, we were groundbreaking at this point, Jason, that we, we, we stuck it out for another three quarters. At that point, even I realized it was not sustainable. So that's what sent me to Columbia Business School. And um, at that point in Columbia, I was one of only five women in the class. And at that point, um, they arranged everybody alphabetically. And so you had to get up and explain who you were and why you were coming back to Columbia. So all these people are getting up in front of me. I'm Phil Giaquinto. I'm in charge of data processing for Chase. I hear I need an MBA. And I'm getting increasingly panicked. These people know what they're doing. So it gets all the way down to me, and it's an S, S for space. So I get up and I say, my name is Mary Spaeth, and I'm here because we went through two years of capital in 13 weeks. And everybody laughed, and it was funny to them. And I learned, though, that there's this whole, you I'm sure know this with your background, there's this list of mistakes that small businesses make. We had made them all, some of them two and three times. But going to Columbia really changed my life because that was the credential on top of the bizarre life I had led that led me to be picked as a White House fellow. And that took me to Washington and to Judge Webster's office at the FBI, uh, where I became at least a semi-serious person. So that's a quick encap encapsulation of how I got, at least from Henry Orient, to the FBI. Probably a trip not many people have taken. Most likely not, and that's why I call you a renaissance woman. You, you, you really are. And Okay, so you bring up two really cool things. that it's, it's fascinating, the timeliness of this. Yesterday, I was on a panel at Stephen F. Austin State University uh, speaking to students about entrepreneurship. And two things that you just mentioned tied to what I was telling these young people. One, uh, I told them the greatest thing that I think that I could contribute to the panel is that I had made just about every mistake that an entrepreneur could possibly make. So listen up. If you, if uh, maybe you won't make them, uh, so I can completely relate. I think that's part of it. And I actually, uh, we had a uh, a young uh, young lady ask a question: How can I start a business and not make mistakes? And I told her. Don't start the business. Don't start the business. You're gonna, and you want to make those mistakes. Those are the best lessons because it's like touching the hot stove. You, you know, that's how you figure out what not to do. The second thing that you said there that is so cool about the show that you produced uh, is it's so. And this was in the mid '70s, you said. Yeah, mid '70s. Okay, which is unbelievable because back then there was no social media there was no instagram there was no youtube there was no vimeo all these things that right now jason there weren't even any cell phones yeah i mean we were like nancy drew we were always looking for the payphone. right and, and what you did is the second point that it really brings up to me is i told this story yesterday rylan who i mentioned my oldest daughter who's going to the university of alabama I ask, you know, obviously, like any parent would do, if I'm going to go spend all that money to send her out of state to a university, what do you want to do? And she wanted to be in sports broadcasting. I said, that's fantastic. I said, in the day and age in which we live, what you should do right now is go to Alabama and create a, an Instagram presence, a social media presence, where you are the go-to source for all things Alabama football to the students. And, and build your following, build your subscriber base up so that whenever you graduate, don't wait to graduate in four years, go do the internships, go make your tapes, send them to stations, go do it now. It's so much easier for her and her classmates to do that sort of thing. And you're doing it in the mid seventies with none of the technology. That's why I'm interviewing you, Mary Spade. That is remarkable. So you end up in Washington D.C. and then what? How long are you there? And then and how, how do you end up in the Reagan administration? Well, I went to Washington on a program. Can I do a plug for the White House Fellows? Absolutely. Uh, the White House Fellows program was started by uh, John Gardner, who was the Secretary of what was then Health and Human Services under Lyndon Johnson, and his vision was to create something like the Rhodes Scholarship but for Americans that would bring them to Washington, give them very high level exposure to government, and then send them back 
to their communities um, newly enlightened and committed. Mm -hmm. And you compete by region. And um, uh, there's some people like Colin Powell was a White House fellow. The, the alumni list is, with the exception of yours, truly pretty remarkable. <clears throat> so um, I get picked as a, um, as a White House fellow. And um, I flew out. I was working at ABC at the time for 2020. And they flew me out to see Tom Johnson, who was then publisher of the Los Angeles Times, who was one of the first class of White House fellows. Because I was desperate. I had, here, I have this new Columbia business degree. I wanted to go work for Secretary of the Treasury Mike Blumenthal. I thought, that is how you become a serious person. So to my horror, Tom picks up the phone and he calls the director of the FBI, Bill Webster. He says, Bill, I know you've been asking for a White House fellow. I've got this young woman in my office. I think she'd be great. Like, no, no, no. And I see my career crumbling before my eyes. So I end up with Judge Webster, the best White House fellows year anybody has ever had. Because Webster, of course, this extraordinary person. Um, he was in the third year of his um, tenure as an FBI director. Um, I was one of the first two women on his executive staff, and I was the only non-lawyer on his executive staff. <clears throat> and special assistants had project responsibility and liaison responsibility. <clears throat> And so everybody else had serious stuff, you know, foreign counterintelligence, criminal, uh, constitutional law issues. So the youngest, the, 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 the newest special assistant, particularly one who is not a lawyer, my hand is being raised, okay, got all the cleanup stuff. So I got all the mop-up stuff. I got the ab scam investigation and all this fascinating stuff. Um, and I think um, I can show you some of the clips, Jason, but I... I think I made a contribution to the FBI, and I learned a lot from them because um, uh, a lot of their job, of course, are to be tough guys. I mean, and they, frankly, if you are a bad guy, they want you to think they are really intimidating. However, on the other hand, they've got to go build public confidence and trust, and you don't get that by intimidating people. You go out there by talking about your mission and what you're doing and by being accountable to the American public. And Judge Webster believed in that wholeheartedly. But I was the first person really on his staff who believed that and had an impact on, which I believe has lasted to this day, to this concept that you've got to get out in front of the American people and talk about what you're doing, field the tough questions, and hold yourself accountable. So I've been at the FBI for a year plus, and my roommate is a White House fellow had been working for a guy named Jim Miller, who became the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission. And um, Jim was a wonderful economist, the only economist to hold the chairmanship. On his first day at the commission, um, he held a press conference. And he's still thinking like an academic. So the beat report, remember following the Carter years, there was not a love, lot of love lost for people who were advocating deregulation. So the reporters say, Dr. Miller, what sort of changes do you want to make at the commission? And Jim falls right into the trap, and he says, well, I've always thought that the ad substantiation rule lacked economic justification. And for those of your listeners who may wonder, ad substantiation means if you're going to make a claim in an advertisement, you have to substantiate it. And it had become, by then, the bedrock of the advertising business. So here was the chairman of the FTC apparently saying, we're going to throw this out the window. The industry goes ballistic. Anyway, that's what brought me over to the Federal Trade Commission with this, you know, solve this, save this. <clears throat> and um, I forged a very close relationship with the bureau directors and with the chairman, <clears throat> um, who was just a, you know, wonderful guy. And um, and then and Jim, it was. I've always been fortunate. Another plug to your listeners. He said, be kind, be generous. Um, Jim Miller was one of the most generous people, and his best friend was Jim Baker, the chief of staff at the White House. And so as under the Federal Trade Commission, I had a number of assignments from the chairman, which I threw myself into, and, and we got real good results, um, largely because it was a very cohesive team and because the time was right to have regulation that made sense. So Jim Miller and Jim Baker talk frequently, and Jim Baker saying, Miller, you're doing a great job. And Jim Miller says, oh, you know, that's Mary Spaith, my director of public affairs. And I have to say, don't, don't do that. 
You're supposed to claim the credit. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate the No, no, no. But Miller was a nice guy. So um, when Dave Gergen, who was the communications director, um, walked out of the White House, Jim Miller, Jim uh, Baker, the chief of staff, called me over, and he said, we're moving you to the White House to be in charge of media. What do you want to do? And as you can imagine, I had a little bit of forewarning about this. I had a, quite a thought-out list of what I wanted to do, and Baker said, uh, go do it. So that's wow. how I got there. Wow. And, and, of course, we had a president who was wonderful. Yeah, and, that, and I want to touch on that a little bit before we move into uh, space communications, uh, just for the listeners, because the, the wonderful thing about Ronald Reagan at least what history has shown to some degree is that if ever there were a universally universally loved and at least respected and admired president in my lifetime, you know, I'm a, I'm a Reagan child, uh, it's Ronald Reagan. What was it like being in that environment before, with him at the head? Before I answer that, Jason, I think it's worth pointing out in today's current environment that when Reagan was president, he wasn't universally loved. Very and true. I took an amazing amount of grief from my friends in New York. He's just an actor. You know, his biggest role is with a chimpanzee. You know, he's an idiot. Um, and one of the great things for Reagan, I'm not sure I would give this advice to everybody, but for him it was good advice. Um, he had the self-confidence to allow himself to be underestimated. I mean, now people recognize he was a terrific writer, he was a terrific reader. He was really a philosopher. That was not the case when he was in office or probably to the four to eight years. I mean, it's probably a tough thing to say, but it was only with his handling of Alzheimer's that suddenly people became a lot more generous in how they judged him. And I think that's worth remembering. What was it like to be there? Well, a quick uh, uh, lesson for your listeners. Media, which was my office, was all the uh, uh, press outside the White House press corps. You've all seen the White House press corps. That's where people stand up and yell at the, at the press secretary. Um, those are the people who are accredited full-time to cover the White House. So you had to help the president deal with Sam Donaldson. No, no, that's the good news. I didn't have any okay. of the press corps. They belonged to Larry Speaks. <laughs> okay. and, and Jimmy Carter set up the media office, and you got to give him credit. He gave it different reporting lines because he recognized that the White House reporters would try and squash it. But he said a press outside of the White House press corps, which means all local press, and it means all trade press. So if you write for Agriculture News, or, or the American Bankers, as it would, that, or the Indianapolis Star, all that media belongs to media. And it doesn't report to the White House press corps. It reports to Jim Baker. So it was a dream job and we did all kinds of interesting things we started satellite now of course my children roll their eyes and say but mom that was the last century and then it occurred to them that it was the last millennia which they thought was even funnier but we started these satellite interviews where we'd package five stations together and the big thing that we started was something called the white house news service um, this was actually the brainchild of of all the departments agriculture and when I was at the Federal Trade Commission looking to try and see how are people, what are they using, what vehicles, what's new? Agriculture had partnered with a company then called ITT Dialacom. And if you had these funny cups, funny rubber cups on a primitive computer, it was a dial-in service and you you put the phone in the cup and you dial it, me, 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 and then up on primitive black and white computer screen came the Agriculture News Service. And I thought, I want it, you know, I could see it. So the day I started at the White House, and Baker says, what do you want? I said, I want that. And like the next day, the ITT Dialacom people materialized in my office and said, you know, show us what you want us to do, Ms. Spaeth. I said, I want the White House News Service, everything that the White House Press Corps gets, and anything else I can get my hands on, I want to load into it. So if you are anybody, not just a reporter, but every press operation in the country, that has, can afford a primitive computer and a telephone uh, and, and an account with ITT Dialacom, they can get the White House news service simultaneously with the White House press corps. So it was the first, if you'll pardon and probably unwise comparison, it was the first, you know, stab in the heart of the monopoly of the White House press corps. Wow, so ever forward <laughs> thinking, which right. is pretty cool. And right. then, so from the White House, then where do you go? Well, the, um, 
can we stay on the white coast? I'd like to say a shout Absolutely. out. We can stay on, on <clears throat> anything you want to. Well, you asked what it was like working for Reagan. Absolutely. Um, but also a shout out to then Vice President Bush, because we set up this system. <clears throat> Even then, Jason, I w it was clear people were reading less and less. And so the issue was, how do you reach them in the way that they want to consume news? <clears throat> and um, I pointed out to Jim Baker that if I could get five stations and get five minutes each on their local newscast, like the 6 o'clock news, I had audiences that rivaled the networks. Plus, I had five minutes. <clears throat> and the local anchors, while they were where they were at that, they would still ask probing questions. They weren't asking Jim Acosta type questions. So, um, and I used to love to call up. I'd call up, you know, then we'd figure out what news stations we wanted to put together depending on the issue. And I'd say, is the news director free? They said, no, he's busy. I said, okay, well, this is Mary Spath at the White House. Oh, he's free, he's busy, he's free. I'll go get him free, Spath. <laughs> And so we do five sequential interviews, <clears throat> five minutes each, straight to camera. And we set up a system where they had to take uh, two cabinet secretaries first. And uh, Secretary Bell of Education was the one we were really pushing to talk about a nation at risk. Then you got in line for the vice president, who was then George Herbert Walker Bush. And then that got you in line for the president. Um, and Mr. Bush and his staff were great. And I remember my seminal memory is that um, one day, we, these things had piled up, but we had to make good on our commitment. So we did like 25 of them. So we did like five batches in a row over about an hour and a half. And at the end of it, Mr. Bush was, um, I think he wouldn't have minded me saying this. He was a little disoriented. Because um, you'd have the call letters, the, the city, and the anchor's name on a little card next to the camera. And he came up to me and he said, Mary, let's not let these pile up quite so much. I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Bush, absolutely. Uh, but the president was, the president loved these. I mean, he was in his natural state. And my favorite story from that is that one of the times we had the five stations, one of them was Detroit. <clears throat> and um, uh, Mort Krim was the anchor, and he said, uh, Mr. President, the auto talks are coming up. You are a union president. Are you going to get involved? And he said, no, I don't think so, Mort. I trust both sides will show good judgment and restraint. <clears throat> well, the next morning I get a call from the White House about 5 a.m. Baker, Jim Baker, is furious. Washington Post headline, President urges restraint on auto workers, which... He had, they just conveniently truncated his comment. But the other reason I love that uh, interview, which went really quite well, is at the end of it, um, Mort says to the president, well, Mr. President, anything else you want to say to Detroit? I have no idea how the president pulled this off. It was not me. He reaches in his jacket, pulls out a baseball cap, puts it on, and says, go Tigers. Well, of course, the station went wild. And they can, you know, they promote that piece every 10 minutes. So um, I was enormously fortunate to have a lot of support. As long as I stayed out of the limelight myself, because the, if you put yourself for, you see this with every White House, Jason, but this one is certainly a good example. The minute people think you're promoting yourself, you get kneecapped. So I tried to stay invisible. <clears throat> as long as uh, Jim Baker and Mike Deaver were happy with me, that meant the president was happy, that meant we were doing, and the president had, we did the first briefing for um, editors of women's publications. We did all kinds of different things. Um, we used to do these briefings, we called them regional briefings, where we would gather, we'd pick press uh, from a couple of different states, and one time we were doing weeklies from Pennsylvania and southern New Jersey, Philadelphia and southern New Jersey. <clears throat> and so, the briefings are pretty standard, two hours, 30 minute blocks, 20 minutes of whoever your briefer is and 10 minutes of questions. <clears throat> and we're in the one room in the White House that accommodates 200 people, room 450. And a couple of days before that, the schedulers called and they said, you know, we've got a spot open. Do you think the people who are coming for your briefing for the regional weeklies would like to have lunch with the president? I said, oh baby. <laughs> that won't be the easiest deal ever sold. So we let everybody know. 
So we have the briefing, and then they go off to lunch with the president. And next to the president is sitting a guy named Hans Bergemuller. And he owned, I can't remember, Jason, dozens and dozens of weeklies, many in foreign languages like Ukraine and Russian. And he didn't touch lunch. He sent by the whole lunch looking at the president. I'm sorry, you're li imagine me staring at Jason, mouth open. Well, AP ran the picture of the president talking to him and him looking at the president as their picture. And it said, Hans Bogermaler has lunch, has lunch with the president. Well, next week, all of his papers came out. They were tabloids. The whole top of every one of these 30-some-odd papers is this AP photo. Hans Bogermaler has lunch with the president. And then the entire proceedings from all the briefers were reproduced inside. Wow. The most spectacular briefing ever. Wow. Anyway, so... <laughs> a, gr a great time, a, a dream job at a dream time. Well, and I mean, that's kind of what's what's amazing about that, and most of the listeners, I think, will know this. Uh, there's two things you, you said there, just as a general principle of operating within any organization. You were, self-promotion is obviously frowned upon and can also, and, and in some ways, can hamstring you, especially when you're working for a guy who is constantly touting that there's no limit to a, a man's success as long as he doesn't care who gets the credit, which plays yeah. right into... Right, that was a little block on his desk, and he and, would point to it. Yeah, and then secondly, you know, as we start talking more about you, your career now and what you're doing, I mean, literally, Mary Spade, you are one of the senior communication professionals working for the great communicator. I mean, that's Ronald Reagan's name. So it's kind of remarkable. And uh, I think it just means I'm old. <laughs> I said, at the Cox School of Business where I teach, and I teach a, a three-hour seminar called Communication is a Strategic Business Tool. Um, and my students are really smart, and they're already successful, and they're graduate students. They were not alive when I worked for President Reagan. Wow. Very sobering. Well, and I have to make a plug there. You know, being a Cox alumni myself, for those of you, the listeners, the Cox School of Business is at Southern, Me Southern Methodist University, which, you know, Harvard likes to think of itself as the SMU of the East, I'm told. So, you know. We it, wish. <laughs> so, <laughs> Good try, Jason. <laughs> well, you know, I'll cling to that, right? Okay. Well, now let's talk about Spaith Communications. What does Spaith Communications do? First of all, 87 yeah. It's founded, so actually, it's kind of right there at the tail end of the, the Reagan administration. Yeah, this is actually embarrassing because I like to clean this story up. Okay. <clears throat> but uh, all my pals will rat on me. So I married Tex Lazar, uh, the chief of staff of the Department of Justice and the um, associate, um, assistant um, attorney general for legal policy. And he, as you can guess with a name like Tex, he's a Texan, and he wants to come home. So we arrive here, and I've had a couple of false starts, but... Then I went into business for myself, and I thought, you know, I've had such an interesting life. Somebody's going to hire me to do something. So our first call, my first call on my first day, was with the CEO of what used to be Southwestern Bell Telephone. And they were one of the first companies that encouraged their employees to go talk to customers, to talk about the company. And the CEO turned to me and he said, Mary, you know what we've learned? We've learned that the customer does not remember what we thought we told him. And I thought, boy, I should have recognized that. But I had this epiphany where I recognized that I had been thinking about communication with the mindset, what do I want to say? What do I think somebody needs to know? Because the minute you ask how much do people remember, a lot or a little, everybody knows it's just a little. And I wondered if anybody had studied that because I thought, boy, that you could do a whole lot better if you understood that process. So that was the first day. The second day, we had calls with what was then the Baylor Healthcare System and the National Audit Practice for the accounting and consulting firm of Arthur Anderson, which was then headquartered here. And they both hired us just based on this insight. But they gave us different assignments. Baylor said, we do not do a good job getting everybody involved. And that's grown over three plus decades to this concept that every employee is an ambassador of yours. Now, the organizational challenge is how to recognize that, how to enlist people, how to equip them, and then most important, how to deploy them with what your overall goals were. And I'll come back to that in a second. The Arthur folks said, this is a seminal insight that you've had. We're going to invest in you, but we want you to develop a model and a methodology. And so we put together this strategic model called the influence model, 
which says who's the audience, what routes of information do we control, what routes of information do we not control, namely the media and verbal communication, and how do we make those all work together, both in a holistic and integrated sense, and of course that becomes extremely important in any kind of adverse incident that threatens a reputation. Um, over the years we've gathered, as I think, Jason, you remember because you've seen our work, the largest library of real examples on video, we think, in the world. So first of all, that turns out to be a great way to teach people because most of us are visual learners, so every little tidbit we have illustrations for. But it also makes it a lot of fun because many of them are screamingly funny. And we were off to the races and literally have just been blessed ever since then. Um, I'm, uh, some of those same um, uh, clients from 32 years ago, particularly the Arthur Anderson people, are still clients today, not at Arthur, of course, which blew itself up. But um, we, again, we've been, people have been enormously generous and kind to us, and we've just been the beneficiaries of it. Well, and I would say, though, that a lot of hard work and um, incredible execution has had something to do with it as well, because uh, in, especially in this town, in Dallas, where we sit, you know, when it comes to crisis management and messaging, uh, space communications, you, you, you all are the, the elite of the elite. So let's talk a little bit about the phone calls that you get. When, it, when am I going to most need space communications? Let's say that I'm a, a CEO of... Uh, of AT&T, Southwestern Bell, uh, whatever, why do I call other than not remembering what we thought they would remember or what we wanted them to know? Why, what, why would I call Space Communications? Let me take a step back because um, the best kind of crisis prep really is before it happens. And um, I feel when I convince a company to do that, I've really made an impact. And a key part of that is not just imagining the scenarios that go wrong. <clears throat> it's asking a couple of key questions. So for example, when something goes wrong, the first thing that people do is they go to the company's website or they Google it. And so I tell people, you better be able to show me a narrative that I'm going to be able to see that competes with whatever the problem is. Whether it's, you know, are you a diverse community? Do you treat people well? If you're a large company, do you give back to the various communities? Um, so that's the first thing. The next critical thing is, will your employees and your customers stick up for you? And that's the area where I think today, anybody within the sound of my voice would be well served to think about that. And I'll give you an example from a non-client that we're using as a teaching example at Cox, um, Wells Fargo. Two, I mean, years of, of trouble. I mean, every time they turn around, there's another shoe like a centipede, you know, all these shoes that are dropping. They've had two major branding campaigns in the last two years. Of course, that's a sign of trouble when you spend millions and millions and millions of dollars rebranding yourself, and it doesn't work. And so all of a sudden, oops, well, you know, let's try plan B. Uh, I sold a house in the M Streets last summer, and I was a Wells mortgage holder. So I'm on the phone with the Wells representative. So this is what we call the golden moment, okay? Person-to-person -person communication. I'm already a customer. He works for the company. And I'm waiting to see, does he do anything that echoes this rebranding campaign, which was all based on trust, okay? And he was perfectly competent, you know, perfectly perfunctory. Not a word. I mean, now I don't need him to say a lot, but I needed him to say, Thanks for giving us a chance to earn back your trust. Okay. Just that never took it. In other words, this conversation was totally divorced from all the advertising, all the marketing, all the stuff that they were doing. And yet it's the employees and that magic moment, that person-to-person -person communication, that companies need to take advantage of. Um, by contrast, if you look at some of our other clients, and I'll name one that people know very well, of course, that's FedEx, okay? Um, if you engage with their people, their mantra is, I will make every FedEx experience outstanding. And they call it the purple promise. Notice that it starts with the word I. It devolves down to the individual employee. And that's critical. So the, I'd ask everybody, whatever your company size, will your employees and your customers stick up for you 
employees turn out to be the best recruiting tool any company has. And it's when your employees will say, you know, this is a company that's given me good service. This is a company that I trust. That's when you know you've got a well-functioning communication program. And then you're really set up not just to weather crises, but to really capitalize and grow in the future. So that's the, the, the critical message that I teach is communication should be the same across an enterprise. And you should have a philosophy of communication just as you have a philosophy of everything else. Who's the audience? How do I understand and influence what they hear, what they believe, what they remember? And then how do I engage and enlist them to go talk to the next person? That's the definition of a good communications program. Okay, and so I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here because this is your wheelhouse, and then I want this to lead us into the Bimbo newsletter, okay? But before we get there, so I want the listeners to uh, to see the master at work. So I'm a CEO, and I bring Mary Spaith from Spaith Communications in and say, Mary, the message I want to convey to my customers, you can trust me. What's my message? Well, the first question is, is it true? Um, one of my favorite clips, Jason, is uh, the CEO at the time of a company called Easton Bell Sports. And one of the things they own is Riddell Helmets. So, okay, that puts you firmly in the middle of what controversy? No, concussions. Concussions, of yeah. course. So, okay, this is pretty easy. You buy a helmet because it will keep your player safe. But you can't say that. Why? Because it assumes that there's some danger to begin with. Well, right? It's not true, okay. right? Oh, there you go. People keep forgetting. The message that you give has to be true, or at least aspirationally true. Mm. So the reporter is asking uh, Paul, you know, what's your key in terms of this, your companies? And he says, innovation. And if he were sitting here with us, what he would say is, if we think of ourselves as an innovation company, it will change how we recruit people. It will change our relationship with our customers, and that changes our manufacturing process, and it's true. And he, at the time that this interview was conducted, he said, I expect every employee for every one of our companies to proactively engage with people and explain that we are innovation companies and why. So that's the first thing. Um, you, when you, so the first thing you ask is, is it true? And that's generally where the first hiccup comes and of course, Wells would be Wells Fargo would be a great example of of this. Um, you can't make claims that are overly aggressive. You have to say, and they can be what we call aspirational. <clears throat> and I'll give you an, an example, since this is also in the past. Uh, Texas Industries was a client of ours for a number of years. Local company, <clears throat> no longer here. They had a plant in Midlothian, and it was a plant. They were the first facility to burn used motor fuel for fuel. So these guys are solving a problem as well as creating fuel. They were the good guys. Well, unfortunately, they were a bunch of self-appointed, I hate it because they describe themselves as environmentalists as if we're not, <clears throat> but um, they became convinced that the emissions caused cancer. I could never get the uh, engineers to stop saying our emissions are 99.96% free of lead. All people heard was the word lead. 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 Very scary. <clears throat> and I kept saying, the ear wants to hear 100%, but it's not true. I said, I know it's not true, but it's aspirational. What is true is to say our goal is 100%. And the reason why is because we invest more. Every year we get a little closer to it. Why do we do that? Because we're your neighbors too. But they could never see it that way. They got fixated on the statistic not understanding how people heard it. So things can be aspirationally true. Many of the clients that we, de that we work with are real committed to um, diversity. Um, almost none of them are where they'd like to be. But I understand that if it's true that we're committed and we're making progress and we're, we value it, okay, then, you can, then you can claim it as a headline. But, but, but that has to be true. Well, and it, it seems like it would be so fundamental. First of all, is it true to ask just that simple question? So, all right, so my next question would be, all right, here's an example, real life. Mary Spaeth is working for the other team in the White House, and your president has to stand up before the country and say, I did not have sex with that woman. 
how do you handle, how do you advise the president at that time? That's sort of beyond my pay grade, Jason, because I continue to sit to think. I mean, and a 101, anybody in this field will tell you that, first of all, you tell the truth. And the reason you tell me, tell people is because it will get out. You know, I mean, duh. Okay. <laughs> so that's the first thing. And, and the theory, the thinking, although it's interesting, I, I, I have a caveat maybe to add to this. Um, but generally, it is a really good piece of advice. Tell the truth. Tell it quickly. Tell it completely. Now, you get in trouble because um, the caveat to that is when you do that, you need to say to people, here's what we know now. Um, one of my teaching studies is BP and the Deepwater Horizon spill in the Gulf. And they came out, I guess within 24 hours, and said it's, the spill is emitting something like five or 600 gallons, barrels, 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 gallons, whatever it is. Per day. Well, then that number kept growing, 600, 1,000, finally it was 8,000. And people said, so you've been lying. Well, they hadn't been. It had been that every day they knew a little more. So you've got to, to caveat this to say, we'll tell you what we know. We'll be as transparent as we possibly can within the law. Remember facts. We're going to learn new facts, and that may change what we're telling you. So you've got to do that up front, otherwise you get in trouble. And um, in terms of President Clinton, you know, this is an interesting question, um, Jason, because I think um, I don't think anybody – was terribly surprised when he said that. Um, uh, I think you can debate for a long time the ethics of having um, um, sexual relations with an intern. Mm -hmm. I think most people would find that that's not consent, that's abhorrent. But people weren't terribly surprised. It just, um, I think, if I had to guess, and this is purely a guess since I'm on the other side of the aisle, I think he was probably deeply embarrassed. <clears throat> and that's why he... He basically lied. Well, and but and Bill Clinton is a politician, and politicians are notorious for foot and mouth disease, as we know, and they are often featured in the Bimbo newsletter. What is the Bimbo newsletter? Oh, thank you. Well, one of our key teachings uh, was the recognition of the power of negative words. And the interesting thing is if you repeat and deny a negative, people are likely to overlook the denial and hear the opposite of what you're trying to say. And we named the genre for a young woman who was caught with a high-profile but unfortunately married man. And she held a press conference and announced, I'm not a bimbo. And it produced, I got, I've got these paste-ups to this day, these huge stories with a boxed quote in the middle of it, I'm not a bimbo. So we called them bimbo. And um, for actually for a number of years, we would just spot them and circulate them to our clients. And then Anna Nicole Smith announced, I did not marry my husband for his money. Remember, she was the Playboy Bunny, and he was the 89-year-old. I think he was a billionaire, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, oil okay. tycoon. Right. And, um, and that just became, so we made that the bimbo of the year. And my pals at FedEx did a press release and sent it out to the media, which, of course, everybody thought was very funny. So now we do a monthly memo that has the three best, air quotes best, bimbo comments of the month. And then if you are an addicted reader, you can click through to what I call the full bimbo, which is everything I have collected, which will have things like just the wrong thing to say, or one of my favorite categories is the misuse of statistics. But it's actually a serious teaching tool because the point is to remind people of the power of language. Language drives memory. Um, if you can f avoid making mistakes, but then get people to figure out the words that you want them to pick up and repeat you have very powerful tools at your disposal, what we would call strategic business tools. I just put out the, uh, the current bimbo, and the winner is Jesse Smollett's lawyer for her comment, there is no deal. Okay, Jason, I promise you there's a deal. There is a deal. Um, um, I promise you there's more to come um, on this. Um, but again, it's supposed to be funny. Uh, almost everybody, as far as I can tell, who gets it, comes as an email thing, or you can see it on the website, opens it because it's funny. And we believe in entertaining people to try and get their attention. But that's what the bimbo is. Um, if you see them, send them to us. If you take a look at it on the website and sign up for it, um, particularly the categories that are in the full bimbo, because that's also where there are things 
that a lot of people circulate internally in their companies as learning tools. And is that spathecommunications.com? Uh, it's Spath, it should be, you can get to either through Mary Spath or spathecom.com. Spathecom.com. And look, I tell you what, look, <clears throat> considering we live in a day and age now where uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me is completely Whoa, out the true. door. Out it the is door. out the door. It right. is like words are the single greatest nuclear weapon that we have now. At least that's what we're being led to believe. So well, it's true. And, you know, uh, for those, especially those folks that are new in their career, uh, I would suggest subscribe to the Bimbo newsletter. I use it just because it's one, it's good to understand quick, pithy, direct sentence structure, which I think, you know, anyone of us, I've run for office, anyone that's ever run for office, you, you have to understand how to speak in sound bites. You have to try to the best of your ability to control the context. And I think the Bimbo gives a lot of bad examples, but also followed with the, the cognitive good example of how you flip the script. It, we try and do that. Sometimes there is just no good way. I mean, you just sort of shut up. Sometimes <laughs> silence is the best thing to do. Uh, when we get a good example, we do try and include it. Those are almost always in the full bimbo because the three quote bimbo comments, we try and get denials. And the ones I like best is in, are where you can really track that somebody else mentioned the word first and the speaker simply picked it up denied it, and moved on. Um, one of my longtime examples is the CEO of PepsiCo saying, it's a headline of a newspaper article saying, Doritos are not bad for you. <clears throat> and as you look at the article, you can tell that she was asked, what do you say to the criticism that Doritos are bad for you? And she says, Doritos are not bad for you. And the point is, somebody else planted that. She just picked it up, repeated it in the negative. It crowds out the positive message, and it rises to become the headline. And, of course, I love it because PepsiCo is a great marketing company. So they'd never take out an ad that says Doritos are not bad for you. Nobody buys Doritos because they're good for you. You buy Doritos because they're delicious. Right. Right. So, Well, and one of the things I have to do for the listeners that we talked about before I started, before I pushed the record button, is, you know, you hear this uh, statistic that more people are afraid of speaking in public than they are death. Uh, so while I have a communications guru to be able to add value for this audience and hopefully get more subscribers, what is that uh, one to two, as many as you're willing to share thing that someone that's out there that is just frightened, but may either in their job or may aspire to do something that requires public speaking, what can they start doing right now to overcome that? Well, you know, it's interesting, Jason. I've seen that statistic, of course, for as long as I've been in this business. And I really wonder if it's still true. It's, it, it was done decades ago. And it gets repeated periodically. I'm not sure. <clears throat> the first thing is stop thinking of it as public speaking. Um, I tell my students at Cox, I go around and say, you know, what industry are you from? What function are you from? I'm in real estate. I'm in technology. I'm in healthcare. What's your function? I'm in HR. I'm in finance. Whatever your industry, whatever your function, you're in the communications business. And we expect you going forward to be able to understand communications as a strategic tool, to be able to manage it both within your own department, and we expect a lot from your communication skills. So if you start with that, I think that leads up to there. I can't imagine. I don't see a job where you don't have to say something to somebody at some time, repeatedly, over the course of a day. So the first thing is don't make, quote, public speaking into um, uh, this, uh, this, this boogeyman. It's communication. And you start by thinking it's just me and you, whether it's a fellow employee or a customer. What am I trying to convey? And am I articulating that in a nice, clear way? I think the secret of getting good at this, other than, you know, if people access our website, we got several books that are now downloadable for free, all kinds of articles. But the main thing is rehearsal. <clears throat> and President Reagan always rehearsed. And I always hear two excuses why people don't want to rehearse. I'm too busy. And I don't need to rehearse because I'm I already. You're so good. I know it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I know everything. <laughs> right. And my response to that is okay, I, I'm sure you are now. My former boss, President Reagan, that's President of, of the United States, <laughs> he always rehearsed, but hey, if you're too busy, you know I understand. <laughs> right. That sobers people up. Yeah. Um, years ago, when we were working for Arthur Anderson, 
they had a voicemail system which would go right to the partner. So let's say you were dialing um, somebody, you know, John Smith. <clears throat> it went right to, hi, this is John. I'm not here. Leave a message. Bing. Well, the first time I would leave a message, it would always come out, um, hey, John, it's Mary Spaeth. I'm getting back to you. You know that conference we talked about, the Fast Track 50? And I, well, it's this, then it would always come out updated and say, to re record your message, press pound. I always would press pound because the second time it would come out fine. Hi, John, it's Mary Spaeth. I've got some news on the Fast Track conference. The good news is they've accepted you as a speaker. Call me back. Okay. That's really the secret to this is practice. I mean, that's a shocker, isn't it? Right. <laughs> right. Cheapers, you know. Yeah. Boy, I kept that one secret for a long time. Yeah, yeah, go figure. <coughs> All right. Well, we're doing, I mean, I think we're just about to the end, and I, but I, I cannot let you get away with something uh, without at least touching on something you, you've kind of covered uh, almost uh, just in passing, but the fact that you've been a bit of a trailblazer as far as a female leader, seventh, uh, only one of seven at Columbia Business School, if I remember correctly. I think there were five of us. But five? Yeah. Okay, so five. Uh, and then there are some jobs you've held where you were the first female in that role. Um, you know, talk today because there is so much attention right now. Joe, you're on. just telling everybody I'm old. Stop it. <laughs> well, Stop it. Pick something else. No, I'm, no, I'm saying, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, you'll have to, maybe that'll be the Bimbo Award. Don't say you're a trailblazer because, uh, you know, that means that you've been at it something a long time, but no. Seriously, how, how have you done it? And what would you say to, like, right now to my daughters, Rylan and Abby, who have aspirations to do great things, obviously, I have, I want them to do well. Two young ladies, what advice to young women in today's environment uh, would you give them? So, first of all, I think I was fortunate because there were a whole, uh, I would probably, Jason, be in the second wave of women who had a lot of doors open for them. Um, and there were women, and, and when you look back at it, it turns out that there were women blazing trails in the 50s and 60s and 70s all along. We just followed along behind them. Mm -hmm. um, I like to say, as people like my dad, as their daughters grew up, and my, my beloved late father uh, was chief of staff at Wills High Hospital, and um, I remember visiting with him in, um, I guess when I was going off to college, and him saying he would never have a woman resident. You know, that was just, you couldn't be an ophthalmologist. I mean, just women just weren't suited for it. So I came home, I guess about three years later, I'm home for a weekend, and they were going off to the residence annual dinner, and his chief of residence was a woman. I said, do you remember telling me that you'd never have a woman as a resident? And he said, I never said that. What kind of stupid thing would that be to say? Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of men, you would, I mean, if you flashed back, Jason, to the, to the 50s, but you had your two daughters, all of a sudden your views on what women could do would be radically different. I think today women have lots of opportunity, and um, I would... Um, I'm not urging the Sheryl Sandberg lean in, you know, go in there, you know, be a guy, go, go, go get him, you know, yeah, boom, listen to me. Okay. I think you have a lot of opportunity. One of the reasons that I started this little company was because um, I was offered a couple of jobs at the very senior level in communications for large companies. One of my closest friends took a job like that and basically spent two to three weeks a month traveling. Um, I love Tex, I miss him, but it was clear, it, I thought, being a wife and then eventually a mother was going to be a full-time job, or at least a full-time commitment if it's not a full-time job, and to discharge it, um, I couldn't take a, a job like that. I did travel a lot, but uh, generally out and back in a day type things. So I would tell your daughters and anybody else's children uh, that family comes first, and that's the most rewarding. And other people have said this. You get to the end of the life, nobody says, oh, wish I'd spent more time at the office. Okay, Nobody says that. Um, uh, and there are lots of opportunities. Today we live in a much more flexible field, a, a set of fields, and you can do a lot more. So that's, I think, make a difference. As I said a moment ago, be generous. We practice and we talk about golden rule management here at my little company. You treat people the way you would like to be treated yourself. It always pays off in the end. Well, I tell you what, good advice to, uh, to part on. And my friend, someone I've considered a mentor, you have always been there. That's why you're one of the first interviews on this little podcast. And I tell you what, 
it, it, any listener out there, male, female, whether you're in business, whether you're in the world of communications or not, I encourage you to go to spathcom. Dot com. Did I get it right? I think so. Okay. <clears throat> or, or maryspaith.com. Yeah, M-E-R-R-I-E. Just, -E. right, just look up Spaith and there you'll you find There you go. Us. You'll find her. And, and <clears throat> Mary Spaith is in so many ways an incredible role model for, for executives, for would-be leaders. Subscribe to the Bimbo newsletter. You will be glad you did. And Mary Spaith, my friend, thank you, thank you, thank you for taking this time. I am so grateful. Well, it's a great treat to get down and just chat. Yeah. Oh. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Me too. And maybe with a, a few of our closest, hopefully, million friends, maybe. So I think of it as a giant <laughs> podcast. Jason. There, there okay. you go. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, guys. Right. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Texas Titans podcast. Remember, for show notes, go to texttitans.blog. I will also have information on past guests as well as upcoming guests, so check that out, Tex titans.blog and please consider checking out my blog at jasonrightnow.com here i distill decades of business and self-education uh, from topics ranging from the stoic philosophers to billy bob thornton i really think you'll enjoy the make your own rules blog in which i try to remind the reader there is always a different way to look at things and just because society has made an unwritten rule on a particular topic doesn't mean you can't make your own rules. So please check that out at jasonrightnow.com. Also, please follow me on social media. On Insta, I'm at jasonrightnow. And on Twitter, I'm at jasonrighttx. And on Facebook, I'm at jasonrighttx. That's literally just my name, Jason Wright, J-A-S-O-N-W-R-I-G-H-T-T-X, like Jason Wright, Texas abbreviated. Thank you so very much for listening to the Texas Titans podcast. If you liked it, please share it. Please subscribe. I cannot begin to tell you how grateful I am for you spending this time with me. I will do my best to continue finding good leaders, good people to interview and introduce you to here on the Texas Titans podcast. Thanks.